Uh, although I'm originally Dutch, I'm actually a researcher of prehistoric archaeology in Japan. And um, I've worked for three years at Tokyo University at the Cultural Resource Studies uh, Department. And I've, I've, apart from my sort of archaeological research, I'm also very interested in the role of archaeology in modern society. I had a lecture series uh, about that, and I actually got my students involved as well, of sort of thinking what is the role of archaeology in modern society. And something that I find is a slight contrast with my native Netherlands is that Japanese people, um, how can I put this, are fairly obsessed with their cultural identity. They're extremely interested in their culture, including their archaeological and prehistorical past. And that actually means that, that people are sort of already emotionally kind of committed. That they're already, you, you don't have to do an awful lot to win them over to be interested in archaeology. And uh, a part of it is, is, is really good, and part of it is also that you, you do tend to have a slight commodification of archaeology, because there are already certain expectations, and Japanese people also have a kind of valorization. For them it's very important, for example, the beautiful material culture or structures, if they're already awarded a title such as national treasurer or national historical site. And in some cases, they're also pushing for world heritage, which is the holy grail of valorization, basically. So there, there is also a kind of a real pride in the culture, but also that, that can have, of course, this sort of slightly ideological uh, problem, problems, and it can also, and it can, of course, be abused potentially by many stakeholders, including in political ways. But uh, people are already relatively, I, I think, for example, what Anup was saying, Dutch people are interested, but it sort of trails off a little bit after a while. Japanese people, I find this, this, this interest is, is already inherently stronger there. And people love to go and do workshops. Now, I get to make more into that. Uh, and, and they really like it, of course. There's the Japanese tendency to make everything cute as well. So th those are all, all uh, aspects. <laughs> of course, of course. Uh, well, uh, there's many, many different examples. But after the war, uh, one of the way ways that people sort of had something to look forward to is uh, archaeological excavations. Of course, there were the professionals, the professors. But again, also a great commitment of local population who, who were sort of distracted from horrible war situations by going to digs and helping by even making food and, and sort of cheering the excavators and the students on. So there was already a commitment there that some, some places people were so excited about finding out more about their past. And um, nowadays we have these archaeological centers, these buried cultural um, property centers that, that sort of manage the locally found archaeological heritage. And you actually have, I think, thousands of these. It's on the prefectural level, it's on the municipal level, and very much a little bit what they do is these archaeological hotspots. Uh, they have museums, but uh, they, they, they keep archaeological uh, finds because they belong to the Japanese people. But they also, they, yeah, people can come, definitely show the stuff they found in their backyard. You know, they do these, these workshop activities, and the curators very much depend structurally on volunteers. And that's, that's going to be my point. Volunteers are structurally important in sort of mediating, they're sort of translating, because sometimes curators are a bit intimidating. So people like to interact with a sort of familiar faces with these volunteers. Well, this is a very famous site, Santa Mariama, and actually I had a very in-depth conversation with a volunteer lady there, and that, that's going to be one of my major slides. But one of the activities that nowadays, because of course there's a great professionalization, but nowadays what I found in my own experience of hundreds of sites is that what you usually see, uh, the activities are slides from museum guidance, that uh, guides are trained, they have a nice little vest on, and they show people around and give them the story. They tell them the story of the site and of the museum. And another activity that's, and that they have, even here in English, which is a major commitment for Japanese people, they, they have this whole layout, they get training, and they have this whole story they have to, they can tell, even in English nowadays in some sites. And the other main activity is assisting at workshops, and these are fun little things to do, mm -hmm. for especially children and, and sometimes adults as well. And I found that many people love to just bring their children to these workshop events, even if they're not interested in the local archaeology. They just grandparents come, bring their children, and uh, like, okay, go, go and do the, one of these events. And I'm going to just show some of the things that they do, for example. Very popular is uh, fire making. 
Yeah, you can see here the enthusiasts. The they love to do fire making. Extremely popular is making jewelry out of soapstone. And they actually have these pre-sold kits. And so what I do for the cost project, I know two euros, you have these little sets in this. If people want to have a look, this is one of the standard activities you can do all through Japan. Children love this. What I found hilarious is boys also love it. They walk around with their little pen and I'm so proud of it. Mm -hmm. So these are these things that are very, very popular with children. And a major thing is really involving children. Children is, is so, so important. So they have these little sets. You can make clay figurines. You, um, you can sort of weave baskets. One of my specializations is prehistoric archaeology. That's why I have these examples. So these are very specific on the specific and prehistoric period. What I found hilarious is that they teach these little, these little, really, these, these small kiddies, mm. right? Like three or four years, they have these blunted uh, arrowheads. They get to shoot at, uh, at cardboard animals, like proper hunter gatherers. And the children love it. Uh, they, they really adore this. So here you see the children in action. So you get these, these tiny kids of like three, four years old already involved there. So that's a major thing. And uh, if we talk about who, what kind of people are doing this, well, of course, as, as a researcher, I've visited these, these sites and these centers all, all, through all days of the week. So um, weekdays, of course, very obviously, people who have a job cannot do volunteer activities. So actually, the majority of people who are probably involved are indeed retired people. Because they're always available, they're always there. And they're actually really organized in structural organizations. There, there will be people on the top to manage them. So it's actually a huge commitment of time uh, because, yes, they have to commit to a certain minimum amount of time they're available, they have to get the schedules, it's all very seriously managed. So there's no sneaking out there. This is a big commitment that people are making. They have to get their schedules long in advance and they can't sneak out. They don't get paid, so there are actually, uh, many archaeologists are now getting a bit concerned that maybe this is actually a bit of exploitation because there is a huge labor investment here, uh, a huge dependent, uh, dependence on their labor. But on the bright side, um, the people, uh, everybody I asked, they just love it, you know. And especially for retired people, they fall in a vacuum after retirement. They have this social isolation element. And for them, it's, and I think this was a really interesting point actually, it's a great way to be involved in society and, and, and continue to meet people, have fun with the kids, you know. So for them, it's, it's the, the, the social element, but also they are genuinely passionate about their local history, basically. So for many people, it's not just a hobby, it's basically a passion. And like, you know, they dress up and, 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 you know, you do all these things, they really, really love it. And to some extent, they follow a, um, a script, but to some extent, they also uh, improvise. Only in one uh, example I found of a, a major um, um, center, archaeological center, that did not work with volunteers, and they had a reason for that. But this is, uh, this is a wonderful lady. There are actually women involved as well. Sade Mariana is a very special site, a very special heritage site that is now one of the sites given for world heritage status. Uh, this lady is, is, has been involved since the beginning. They found this site in the early 1990s, it blew up, it, was, it, it completely changed public perception of what this period was all about. The mass media got involved, everybody heard about this site, this is one of the most famous type sites of the whole country. And the volunteers, they, they just dug in there from the beginning, and they have the most, one of the most organized and active volunteers activities possibly in the entire country on this period. Nowadays they have 100 volunteers, they are managed by professionals, and it's very, very, it's very serious. They have to be at least six times a month. They have to have three hour blocks that they give away of their time. They don't get paid for this. They only get maximum something like 10 euro for transport costs. For, for, for. They don't even get uh, a lunch unless they commit for a whole day for a special event. And on the bright side, they do get some of the study trips and special lectures of, of specialists that are floating, because these people get serious training. This is very good. These people are very committed, basically. She, she does these workshops, but what she particularly loves is taking people around the site. And I also had an in-depth conversation with her about that, because I noticed sometimes curators tend to tell a specific story. It's sometimes a little bit oversimplified, a bit uh, homogenized, basically. 
And I feel that it is not always supported by the facts. And say, she agrees, like, no, you can't dumb it down. You have to tell a, a factually accurate story. So this lady is really, really, uh, although she's is not an official archaeologist, she is very knowledgeable, basically. And there are many, many people like her. Um, there are, I think she, she told me, there are uh, women involved as well, housewives. Uh, but of course, yeah, it, it's a bit difficult because if you ask people to give so much of their time, you're not paying for them. This is a bit of, of, of a tricky situation. So they have these strong offensives to get women more involved. I mean, look, look at this very elegant Jomon period. This is hilarious because this, this particular prefect is proud of their Jomon prehistoric heritage, but also of their apple uh, <laughs> cultivation. So it's come, you see how the local identity, the specific local identity is really knit in there. And what I find interesting is that nowadays, not just for volunteers, but what I really love about some places is that they actually put aside money to employ local housewives to do cute little things. And I actually have some, I think, examples only that they can sell and they can get a little bit of money. Because obviously, especially in rural areas, people are struggling nowadays. So they cannot afford to just give time. They need to get something in return. And especially this place, I really admire this place. It's in Nagano and Nagamachi. It's an obsidian museum who is one of the people training local housewives to make cute little accessories of obsidian and giving them a little money in return. They also do, um, I thought this was, this, I just saw this a week ago, I thought it was spectacular. They have a big event introducing this, this obsidian quarry from the Jomon period. They invented thousand people from the whole uh, prefecture. What they did is they got local sculpture on the wall. So they got 73 uh, local school children who were like 12, 13, 14 years old, giving them sort of like basic training and did fun activities with them. And then they got to guide the people, the visitors, all, because this is in the middle of the mountains. Mm -hmm. So on, this, on the way, these children get to tell their story. So I saw this little cute um, interview with one of them, one of the boys, like 13 year old boy. He was dead proud. He really enjoyed these activities. And what he particularly enjoyed is that he was able to tell his story to his former primary school classmates and his teacher. This was really, really big deal. He was really proud that he was able to present this knowledge that they didn't have. So what I really enjoyed about this example is that they actually got involved school children. And of course, this is kind of investment because these people, these children will grow up and continue to have this really, really good memory. So I thought this was particularly innovative uh, example that I really liked. So um, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.